signs facing the spiritual traditions, please. Okay, if I find the way where my... Yes. Let's see. Uh, so I am uh, a so-called scientist. I've been working <coughs> most of my life, usually uh, mostly in Zurich for over 33 years working on the origin of life and on the general question, what is life? As the question, what is life, unites science, philosophy, spirituality. So it permits really a good integration of uh, uh, research of uh, human activity. So let's, uh, let us embark together in this uh, scientific view of uh, what is life and uh, also we will see here the interplays with uh, spirituality. Now the first thing you should know, we should know about life is that <coughs> I don't have a pointer but this is uh, one minor thing in, in all this uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are here at the edge of the Milky Way in a not very important point and in the edge of this Milky Way there is a very small uh, star which we call Sun and close to the Sun there is a grain of dust with a little water which we call Earth and as far as science knows this is the only place on our universe where life exists. Uh, and this is a trivial point, but it's also an important point considering spirituality, as for believers, for example, they have to accept the idea that God, the Christian God, or Allah, or whoever had uh, chosen this a minimal dust of grain to implement life there, just there, and only there. It's a trivial but important point. And then our astronomer says that in addition to our Milky Way, there are billions, billions, you mean one followed by nine zero, of uh, galaxies each galaxy is containing billions of suns and planets. So really an immensity coming out, as science uh, claims, from the big uh, singularity, the Big Bang, which took place, according to them, 15.8 billion years ago. So all this immensity out of this little uh, spark of uh, energy so that, you know, philosopher and uh, since antiquity, but also the modern one, ask this famous question, why? Why there is all this instead of nothing? And I mentioned this very famous question also to my students to indicate that this is the classic question to which science has no answer, as uh, is the question, you know, why we are here and what for, where we come from. It's all in the voice of God really protects me. <laughs> and uh, um, so this is uh, uh, and in the last uh, years more and more planets have been discovered around uh, in our own uh, galaxies you know all these are <coughs> planets uh, which are in the so-called habitable zone and according to the astronomers might be, you know, uh, uh, containing form of life. And look at this, that from the last Kepler mission, there is the information that it could be as many as 40 billions 
Earth sized planets orbiting in the habitable zone within our own galaxy. And uh, then here comes all the story of the aliens and uh, you know how many of these uh, uh, planets may be habitable and by whom. And there is the Fermi paradox, Fermi, you know, discussing this question where aliens, if there's such large probability of uh, many Earth-sized planets, where are they? He asked. And, uh, but you know, if you think about it, it uh, is not really a, a, a serious, important question. In order to have uh, communication with aliens, you have to have that the two planets, the two uh, evolution are about contemporary. You cannot have uh, communication with uh, a, a form of life which is 100 million years older or younger, so there must be some form of uh, some uh, simultaneity and also this place must be close enough to permit uh, uh, contact, at least uh, by light. And if you put all these uh, things together, you don't find many cases in which this may be true. But let's... I give you this uh, picture which shows men uh, inquiring into the immensity of the cosmos, where, which is full of, uh, you know, mystery. Here the transcendence comes into play in the form of uh, terms that science calls the dark matter, the dark energy, the expanding universe, the universe which is expanding, we don't know why, and many, many things which are really above our mind, and this for me is an important point. As a scientist, I recognize that our mind, which is the only tool we have to discover and study reality, might be too small to understand and to grasp reality. And when I was a small boy, I was stuck by this uh, vision where in my Sorry, where in my uh, screen I saw a little ant walking around my uh, television and I said, oh, this ant, this ant will never be able to understand how a television works. Whatever it does, that will be a reality which is totally, you know, above and behind all the possibility of its small brain and uh, you know there is this and 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 there is this and you may like or not the analogy <laughs> but uh, I believe uh, particularly when I am in a kind of bad mood that this is a uh, is a kind of uh, important uh, analogy. But now let's go back to our little earth and ask the question, what does science mean with the question, what is life? And more generally is the question whether is life is localized here only in this very tiny grain of sand, or whether instead is something which is instead uh, spread in the universe. Panspermia used to say our uh, scientists a few centuries ago, and even saying that actually life is a cosmic imperative, cannot be present only in our little earth, must be present in all the universe. But Again, this is where science stops. Science stops at the point where life is only there. 
and then you can speculate, have uh, an act of faith, and say, oh, the whole universe is full of life. This is not science, this is maybe beautiful faith, can enrich your essence, can, uh, you know, bring you to write poems and to be a better man, but is not science. Still, we are on the point that science, that life for us is only in that tiny grain of sand. <coughs> and how did the science uh, explain life? There is the, you know, the 17th century with the uh, birth of science, Galileo, Bacon, Newton. The birth of science because uh, before Galileo, Newton, you know, nobody had thought that the phenomena of uh, life, the tides and the sunrise and the falling of an apple, could be explained in terms of natural processes. This was not existing. It began to come with Galileo, Bacon, Newton, and then uh, the triumph of, of uh, this uh, <coughs> philosopher, uh, Cartesio, René Descartes, who is the main responsible, we say, of this dichotomy between rex cogitans and rex essentia. And uh, uh, with that, the mechanistic vision of the world, according to which there is a sharp division between body and mind, according to Cartesio <coughs> and according to Newton, uh, life is a machine and all what is not life, uh, feeling and uh, idea, it belongs to another sphere of essence, which is the spirit or mind, but the two realms are very well separated. And this is something that exists in our Western philosophy and has uh, determined really the course of history and philosophy for over uh, 400 years and which is not, for example, present in India or China where this division between body and mind is not an important uh, division. <coughs> Then, after this mechanistic view, according to which life is uh, a machine, arose uh, from the 1930 a series of uh, very new scientists, almost contemporary and independently from one another. Great men like Alan Turing, uh, von Furster, Gregory Bateson, von Neumann, Jean Piaget, uh, Prigogin, who um, And uh, here it's, uh, uh, there is a piece down uh, which uh, indicates that these people were advocating for something new like uh, cooperation among uh, uh, structure, self-organization and uh, uh, unity of uh, things instead of division. And the one question that came, for example, was very important, was the following. Take a butterfly, which is made by you know, very many different material. There is the wings, which are a kind of silk material. The uh, things which are a kind of cartilage, in, and then the body is a jelly and there are many parts. How all these different parts know that they belong to the same unity? You know, the mechanistic world of Newman and Cartesio could never have uh, given an answer to this question because they were analyzing one piece at a time, the wings and the head, studying that 
and then they were the idea of putting all together, putting all parts together and getting the totality. But the totality is not something which can be put together by putting together the parts. And uh, I have been working <coughs> in the system view of life, in my book with Capra a few years ago, and I give you an example very clear of this, which responds to the question, what is life for science? See, this is the human body, which is made of so many different parts. It's really an incredible amount of, of complexity. And uh, maybe to make things simpler, let's look at the organs. The liver, the lungs, uh, the kidneys, uh, intestine, where all these arrows are not the fantasy of my illustrator, a good friend of mine who did the slides for me, but they are physiology in the sense that the <coughs> intestine in order to work has to feel how the stomach is feeling and the liver cannot do his business without uh, having contact with the kidneys and the heart cannot beat how much beats he wants without feeling uh, the, all the rest of the body. This is just like an orchestra playing harmony where all uh, players, all musicians, must be in tune with each other in order to produce something organic, something complete. <coughs> and of course, as time goes, uh, it may happen, apparently happens to everybody, uh, that uh, there is something called death, where <coughs> these organs are for a while still there. The uh, liver may work for an hour or two, even the heart, but they don't interact anymore with each other. This is the fragmentation, is the picture of death, and uh, this is the picture of uh, life. But here, instead of the organs, you can put anything you like. You can put the common market with all the nation interacting with each other. You can put all cities of uh, Italy you know, interacting. And if you consider the city or the uh, people belonging to a, uh, to a party a separate unit, that is that, not only for a body, but uh, for a political party, for the common union, whatever you like. So this, for science, uh, there is this important system view according to which life is due to the interaction of parts, <coughs> is an integration of the different parts, each making its own business, but each single one, if you take it out, does not give you any information about life in total, per se. It's just working together. And we will see more of that in the next uh, few minutes. And this, of course, uh, this vision of that brings to another important a uh, point of uh, discussion between science and the spirituality. That's where I say that, you know, for some people you die and then there is God that take your soul and uh, or there is karma and uh, for scientists with the death of the individual Nothing is left of that individuality. There is a reshuffling of molecules and atoms. All of us have atoms and molecules 
which belong to you know all dinosaurs or belong to Einstein or to Marilyn Monroe because you know all was dies molecules atoms are there are re reused for other purpose and uh, but the individual is lost and this is really a point I had many conversations with uh, religious people about origin of life and there we you know, always find a kind of uh, compromise and uh, I would say, you know, life comes from natural processes and the priest will say, yes, but these natural processes are being due to the will of God. And I could not say anything against that, but Again, it's an act of faith against uh, an act of uh, science. But now, another point, if you consider this interaction, you say, well, okay, those are the organs of your body. But this kind of interaction, I also find in my watch, where I have many things which interact together, or in my car, and uh, interacting together the different parts make the whole car, the whole watch work. So what is then the difference between a living things composed by interacting parts and a watch? Or a, well, and here we should go another stop, another step towards what is life in a more chemical uh, way, and I take uh, the autopoiesis theory of Maturana e Varela, uh, starting there where life has its uh, uh, <coughs> simplest possible expression at the level of microbe, which are a fraction of a millimeter and uh, are alive and reproduced. And uh, each cell can be represented by this cartoon where there is the uh, membrane which permits some nutrient N to enter, some catabolite H to be expelled, and inside there are many, many reactions. Think that in each of your liver cell now, there are probably about uh, 20,000 transformation a sugar being burned, a protein being hydrolyzed, a vitamin <coughs> being synthesized, and uh, uh, some other ATP being <coughs> formed or hydrolyzed. Many, many. But then you see here a, then an important first uh, uh, strange thing, because if you observe this uh, uh, liver cell under the microscope, <coughs> Despite this 20,000 transformation, you see that the liver cell remains a liver cell. So how is it possible that a, there is this self-maintenance, this continuity, despite the enormous number of transformation? And here we are where life is life for science, for biology at least. Because a cell, a liver cell, remains itself, what we call self-maintenance, because all what is used up in this 10,000 transformation is remade immediately from inside. There is a, a process of regeneration from within. Do not confuse that with cell, cell reproduction. The, all what is used up in a cell or in a lizard is remade from inside the cell or the lizard, thanks of course to energy and food from the outside, but there is a continuity or a permanence, a self-maintenance, despite, and, you know, uh, 
Your hemoglobin leaves in your body for only two, three days and then is destroyed, but is remade by the body itself. And you may believe it or not, but all your cells uh, live only for a few months. 90% of your cells die in two, three months, but are remade anew from the body. And I shave every morning and the beard comes again from inside. So this, uh, the essence of life for science, for biology, is uh, the self-maintenance from within due to this dynamic net of, of uh, transformation. And uh, <coughs> Maturana and Varela say, living system transform inside themselves matter in such a way that the product is their own organization. So what remains constant is the organization inside the cell. Products are destroyed, are made anew, and the organization remains the same. And the fact that the living cell is defined by its organization means that uh, we should interpret life in terms of relations of component more than in terms of the property of the component. Not in terms of DNA. The equation DNA equal life is the most stupid uh, equation that has been propagated in uh, classical science over the last, uh, you know, in this age of uh, genes. DNA is just very important, but just one of the many components of the cell. Water is equally important. Magnesium ion is equally important. RNA, proteins, you know, it's, we will see that bet better here. These uh, which uh, may terrify you for their complexity is one of the <coughs> cells we have seen before. It's the so-called <coughs> Uh, metabolic map where you see all the reactions, part of them, going on in a cell where each point represents a chemical compound. Each line represents a chemical transformation which is catalyzed, as we say in chemistry, by one enzyme which is a big protein. And uh, ve it's very instructive because if you look at that and you ask, for example, this is life of a cell. Wh where, where does life start? And where does life end? It's clear that there is no beginning and no end. Life is the entire entity, the entire interaction of all these thousands and thousands of uh, uh, transformations. This is true for a cell. This is also true for an elephant. And <coughs> but uh, this brings to me, as a scientist, to another question, which for me, as a scientist, is still uh, unsolved. Uh, science, Maturana and Varela, and all the theory of uh, uh, Autopoiesi says that life is the interaction of molecules, which means that if you are smart enough to find how this interaction takes place and you are able to remake it in the lab, you should be able to make life in the lab assuming that all what you need for life is molecules and their interaction. And uh, whether this is so, uh, I believe is still one of the questions and, and the 
interplay between uh, science and spirituality. Do we need something more than molecules and their interaction to make a lizard, to make a fly, to make a bacterium? Or is it real enough to put molecules together? I, as a scientist, uh, having studied this question of 30, 40 years, I don't have an answer. Maybe you do, and uh, I would love to listen. Interaction with the environment, we are approaching another point. Here you see the amoeba. Maybe it's an elephant which eats uh, food in order to maintain its life. And the authors of this theory, Maturana and Varela, <coughs> used to important point the word uh, cognition and the word create. The organism create from the environment its own word, tend to cognition. What does that mean? The cognition is the following, that each living organism is co cognitive because it is able to recognize and interact with its own environment. The fish with the water, the earthworm with the mud, the uh, eagle with the uh, uh, air. So each organism has developed sensorial tools to interact with the environment. This is called cognition, capability of finding food and, and feeding themselves. And uh, also bacteria are cognitive, and here is an important point, but they don't know it. And this is a point of uh, perennial discussion with me and my students, uh, you know, who are also interested in spirituality, when I ask, there is a lizard. Does a lizard know to be a lizard? What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, I think as a scientist, we can say that there is no way to go into the consciousness, into the mind of a lizard to know it, so looking at outside, uh, it's uh, too little. And uh, the tentative answer of the scientist is that the lizard does not know to be a lizard. But you know, how much does a dog know to be a dog? Does a dolphin know to be a dog? And uh, <coughs> here it's uh, this notion of uh, that between life and uh, environment, there is a continuous, there is no division. You look at the spider who, with little bits of things, constructed the net. Uh, the net, he made the net, the web, but is the web that permits the life of the spider. So there is this double error. One creates the one and the creates the other. And the same with the termite nest, where the termites have done their nest, but then what they have done permits their life. And the best example is this um, animal, which we call man, who builds his own schools and avenue and hospital and churches and this construction permits then its essence, his own life. So that in reality life is not only the biological structure but you have to include the <coughs> interaction with the environment otherwise it does not work and this environment it's mediated through cognition to what uh, this uh, biological structure is able to recognize. <coughs> With men, 
this uh, connection becomes mind which uh, has a wonderful new capability mostly that of abstraction of inventing things which do not exist in reality including for some the idea of God and uh, let me give you only two minutes of excursion in Bhutan where I used to do a course for Tibetan nuns and you can see here busy with my what I gave them and the reason why I mentioned that is when I said microbes are cognitive uh, yes they go to eat but they don't know it they have no mind The sweet nuns say, you professor didn't understand anything <laughs> about life and consciousness. And uh, for them there was no way if something, even a, an amoeba, it has an intentionality that is an indication of consciousness and this is the proof that life and life is consciousness and consciousness is life and when I as a simple minded scientist I was saying look the amoeba goes in the gradient of sugar but is the mind of the scientist who projects the idea of feeding itself in this gradient of the amoeba does not know anything about glucose, about gradient, about concentration and uh, this very simple science argument couldn't even touch them and that was me as a scientist uh, as a teacher was very interesting their answer was if there is intentionality there is consciousness and uh, this is an expression of life and uh, the amoeba have consciousness because they have intentionality and they have life and uh, going towards the end uh, let me give you this again but I using a, a Buddhist language where I say if I had a pointer that each point is dependent on the previous one and uh, is causing the next one it's all a question of cause and uh, effect each one is causing the next uh, product being caused by the previous one causality is one of the main pillar of uh, uh, Buddhism which makes very close to uh, science in a way and uh, also here you see that there is no prima causa there is not one point where all starts and finish and the lack of a prima causa in Buddhism the lack of a creative God is another important point for them Causality is indeed the central pillar of philosophical Buddhism and the Lord Buddha used to say if there is this, there is that if that is not there, then the other is not there so it's a continuous uh, causality and if you put this causality together with the principle of impermanence then you arrive at this situation where you see a vision of the world and then we are close getting now close to the transcendence if all things are mutually linked and casually interdependent at the same time continuously change then the entire universe is not made by isolated independent things but is a dynamic totally interactive process 
why do I say this? Because <coughs> the same can be said of the uh, new science paradigm of the uh, that I mentioned before of the uh, unifying of, um, well, I have it the, the before of the <coughs> sorry um, uh, uh, what? Is it possible to conclude? Yes, I conclude now. Okay. You see, this is again all the world together, and uh, this uh, the also the vision that you get uh, from this. And yes, I conclude by saying that uh, that uh, this similarity. It's uh, perhaps only superficial. And here for me an important point. Uh, people saying science should be changed and so on. Science is the study of the external world in a third person where you uh, try to understand what is going on on the basis of the known principle of physics, chemistry, biology. And, uh, uh, and you can in this way arrive at the vision of complexity of the whole universe, but this is not the oneness of the uh, spiritual seeker. The spiritual seeker does not have uh, this duality that this science is and must be based on. Science, in the normal way, is based on duality. I observe things outside of me. The spiritual seeker avoids this duality, and uh, this, I believe, is an important difference that should be. And whether science can be spiritual, we, I believe yes, but in a very particular way, which I call lay spirituality, when Einstein say that uh, looking at the mystery of eternity, one feel the wave of uh, the mystery. And, um, you know, we also say that of this homo, the most important thing is consciousness. But look in this, uh, my last uh, slide, what we have done in the last uh, uh, 30 years, uh, no, 50 years. We have destroyed one half of the earth forest, inserted in the atmosphere large quantity of CO2, you know, all with our consciousness with a global increase of temperature which is going to give a global warming and problem of uh, storming <coughs> and uh, loss of biodiversity and uh, the world population still in misery. <coughs> Any hope of the future? We discussed that on my book but as an answer, I want to give you again the answer of uh, this man who answered to this question over 50 years ago, uh, pointed out that the only solution is perhaps a new form of consciousness. He said, a human being is a part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself his thoughts and feeling as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace a living creature and the world of his beauty.
a beautiful example of lay spirituality. Thank you very much for your attention.